Can you imagine if God were the one sitting there describing you to the painter? I have a feeling it would be even more drastically different and more beautiful. Because I believe that the way that we perceive God affects the way that we perceive ourselves, our community, our family, everything. The way that we perceive God affects us big time. When we understand the God and the gospel message, we begin to interact differently with one another. We begin to see the beauty in each other. We can begin to love and accept each other. And the baggage just begins to drop. Paul in Galatians 2, 15 through 21, he's going to give us some different perceptions, different concepts that God had been labeled with by the Jews and the Gentiles. And at the end, we're going to get this really beautiful picture. Are you guys ready for it? Cool. Let me pray with you. Guys, I want to thank you, praise you for bringing us here today. Lord, the roads were crazy to get here, but we made it. Many of us made it, and Lord, we ask that you will just show us your presence. Let us see who you are, who you aren't. And Lord, when we do this, we ask that you will give us a real clear picture of who we are in light of you. In your name we pray, amen. There are two different kinds of perceptions of God that we're going to look at today. Number one is the negotiator. Everyone say, negotiator. The negotiator. This is how some people view God. It's this way. I do a bunch of wrong things, and the negotiator looks at me and he says, what do you have to offer? What can you give me? We'll negotiate. Yeah, 40% off. Done. Good deal. And we try to negotiate with God so that we can be in a right standing with him. And so we do a bunch of things to try to satisfy the negotiator. We tracking? And so sometimes some of us might be tempted every once in a while to say things like this. God, if you will do this, then I'll do this. Am I alone? God, if you, if you perform this miracle for me and do this for me, I'll stop doing this thing. And God says, oh, well, that seems reasonable, right? And the negotiator agrees, and you got your way. That's this concept of a negotiator. Now, here's another concept in Galatians we see. It's this, that God is like a Santa Claus. And when I was younger, Santa Claus was always this jolly person, this grandfatherly figure. And I would hear the message I would hear that he's concerned with me being a good boy. But here's the deal. I never got coal once in my stocking. I know. Nathan did. That's all he got. But the majority of people I knew, they didn't actually get coal. In fact, most of them got a lot of presents. And the reality was I began to realize that, well, maybe, maybe Santa's not that concerned with how I live. Maybe Santa is just kind of this grandfatherly figure that sits up in heaven, smiles at me, and he's like, oh, you silly. You shouldn't have done that. <laughs> you shouldn't have. But I'm still going to give you a gift because we're buddies. We're going fishing next week. And so Santa, this image of God, also comes into the picture in Galatians. And I believe that this comes into play because we, as people, oftentimes, we misunderstand some things. We misunderstand what the law is, and we misunderstand what grace is. The first concept of law. The Galatians, when they talk about law, they're talking about a couple different things here. Yes, we have the Ten Commandments, but there's also the Levitical law. You guys ready for it? Levitical law. Let's go there. Yes, thank you. Um, Levitical law. These are all the things, the extra things you should be doing or shouldn't be doing. And they even added a bunch of extra additions during the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Levitical laws basically told the Jews who's in and who's out. But what the Levitical law does for us is it makes us realize that we are in need of something bigger than ourselves. And that whole concept of God being Santa Claus begins to fade away. 
And when I understand this as well, an even bigger picture, when I understand the Ten Commandments again as being one through four commands all about my relationship with God, and then commands five through ten all about my relationship with others, this is what happens. Because I'm experiencing God, I'm transformed. I begin to love and accept people differently. Santa Claus God says, I'm not really concerned with that. Our God says, I can't wait for you to experience it. It's a beautiful life. When you've experienced me, it transforms you. That Santa Claus God cannot exist in light of the law. And then in light of grace, check this out, grace. Grace reminds us nothing we've done, nothing we do can make God love me more and love me less. It's all about him, not me. Again, we talked about the waiter. I'm sitting there, I'm eating my food, and the waiter, the waitress comes up and says, your, your bill's been paid. I have the choice. I can say, no, 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 I won't accept it. Or I can say, thank you so much. I can appreciate the gift. I can fight against it, try to work it off. I'll get you next time. Or I can say, thank you. Thank you for the gift. So again, both concepts of God begin to fall apart when I understand grace and law. So let me move along with you. Galatians 2.14 says this. When I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message. I said to Peter in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, had discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? So here's the deal. Two different groups, Jews and Gentiles. So here's what the Jews believed. Let's look at the Jews for a minute. The Jews, there we are. The, the Jews saw God as a negotiator. They believed because they, again, they were Jewish, that their rightness with God came from a strict observance of the law. And so, sinners, in verse 15, you see here him say this, you and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. So here's what a sinner is. You guys ready for it? A sinner is a Gentile. A sinner is someone not keeping the laws, and this is not keeping the laws. You're not eating the right foods. You're mixing your fabrics. How many of you have anything that has cotton and something else in it? Come on now. Repent. Repent. Uh, Levitical law, there was a lot of interesting things there. Walk, uh, waiting 66 days to go to synagogue after giving birth to a son. Did y'all keep that? We didn't. We blew that one. Uh, also circumcision. That was the main one for the Jewish nation at this point in time circumcision. You must do things in order to make the negotiator happy. And so those things specifically Jewish made one good or bad dependent on well, how well one observes the law. So the Gentiles, this is what they thought. They realized they are not Jewish. They realized they weren't Jewish. And the Jews were constantly reminding them of it. You're not good enough. You can't sit at the cool table. You're out. And this was happening. And so they said, well, we're not Jewish, so God, I guess, just accepts us how we are. And they were living lives that were not transformed lives. They were just continuing to live the way they'd always lived, moving closer to death and away from life. And so we have two different groups. The Gentiles saw God as Santa Claus. And again, in John 14, 12, I love this verse, John 14, 12, Jesus, he doesn't buy into Santa Claus God. He doesn't. Jesus spoke a lot about being transformed, the awesome potential he sees in us. The picture he paints of us is totally different. It's pretty beautiful. This is what he says. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. And what works did Jesus do? He healed. He restored he brought people back to life. He gave freedom. That's what Jesus did. You will do those things, but greater. Sanctuary folks, you will do those things and greater. Do you believe it? I think a lot of us are living lives that we don't buy that. Oh, it was nice. Seemed to work for them back then. 
goes on. And even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me anything in my name and I will do it. Jesus believed that when you had a relationship with God, you were transformed. Your life began to reflect life, not death. Y'all following me? They didn't understand what a relationship with someone looks like. Can I give you an example? Good. I'm going to. My friend Chris, he is this guy that when you, when you talk with him, you can't help but just stupidly smile. Because Chris is just a fun, amazing, creative guy. And talking to Chris, you talk to him for just a couple minutes, and Chris begins to make you challenge things in your life and makes you think deeper about everything. I remember going to Chris a couple times and saying, Chris, what do you think of this idea? And Chris would all of a sudden light up again. <sighs> and he would talk more about me than about him. Chris was the man. I love Chris. People talked about, what, what book is Chris reading? Chris would tell you the books he's reading. He's reading like five or six a month. This guy was, is amazing. So a group of us, we go to a wedding, and you guys know how this is. The cool guys, which I got to be a part of at this table. I'm sitting with the guys, and we're at the table. And of course, the women are on the dance floor, and they're doing like, dun -na 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 -na. they're doing these stupid dances, right? And so they're doing the chicken dance or these other silly things. And we're watching and we're laughing because we're too cool for this. We're like, that is just so, so I wouldn't be up there. And we're laughing. And Chris is just kind of smiling because Chris knew how to be in a moment and just enjoy it and see it for what it is. And Chris is just smiling. And all of a sudden, this song comes on. It's called Charlie Brown. And it's funny to me. It's like this dance that it could, it could be like, it would almost fit like a line dancing almost because it tells you what to do. And so Charlie Brown comes on, and all the girls on the, on the dance floor, and there were a couple guys, they all go, yeah! And I'm like, oh, lame sauce. And Chris, Charlie Brown. And he goes, come on, you guys! And he gets up, and we're all like, that's ridiculous. I would never dance to the right, to the right, to the left, to the left. Uh, no. Chris goes right into the middle, right in front, and starts leading the group. And I feel like I'm watching some weird, like, high school musical movie or something. I'm watching, and Chris is just the man. To the right, to the right, to the left. Obviously, I don't look cool when I do it, but Chris did. And I'm watching in awe of Chris, totally taking over this floor, loving this moment, enjoying life. And the rest of us fools begrudgingly because we think Chris is the man. We stood up and we did, you know, the Adventist dance. <laughs> Absolutely no hip movement. <laughs> and all of a sudden we found that we started to enjoy it and it was kind of fun. You can't hang around with Chris without being inspired to dance, to experience life in its fullest. He has this annoying ability to bring out greatness in people, and that's transformation. Chris is like the painter. Just being around Chris, being in his presence, you begin to see yourself differently, which causes these subtle changes in you, and you begin to see yourself as Chris sees you. And the Gentiles, they didn't get it. They didn't understand this. They didn't understand that when you are experiencing Jesus Christ in your life, it literally begins to change everything in your world. All these silly compartments that you thought you could place him in, he bursts out of all of them, and there is just one, and it's just him. And your life begins to change in these positive, beautiful, life-experiencing ways. Some churches might be excited about that. <laughs> Paul had to show both of these parties that there is something profoundly wrong with these two perceptions. And so 
He shows both parties this. Because again, if you're a Jewish person, it can't be that the Jews come to God through the law and the Gentiles come to God through grace. It had to be both parties come to God by transformative grace. Sanctuary, we come to Christ by transformative grace. Our lives are transformed by our understanding of who he is and the grace he has given us. The love and acceptance we experience. So, here we go. You guys ready? Good. Verse 17. Now, let's go to 15. You and I, Jews, are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. He's speaking to the Jews now. You are made by right, you are made right by God, not because of what you're doing, but because of who he is. And we have believed in Jesus Christ so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will be ever made right with God by obeying the law. Martin Luther was really good at obeying the law. And he tried really hard to be perfect. He said, I am probably the most perfect person out there right now. He said that. But he got frustrated because he realized perfection didn't bring him peace. His attempt at perfection didn't bring him peace. And Paul, the same thing. Attempting to be perfect, to be accepted by God, did not bring him peace. He was bringing him more death, more guilt, more shame. It wasn't until he understood God that his life transformed. He becomes Paul instead of Saul. But suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, and then we are found guilty because we've abandoned the law. Now he's speaking to the Gentiles. Would that mean Christ has led us into sin? Absolutely not. Think this one through. It's pretty brilliant. It's like this. If I'm experiencing Christ, who's showing me life, love, acceptance, and I walk away and I'm not transformed, then Jesus was a liar. He was a liar when he said, the gospel message brings life and transformation. If your life is not being transformed and you are not growing in love and acceptance towards one another, what gospel message are you reading? Which understanding of God are you accepting? The gospel transforms. Understanding the gospel helps me function at a new level of life. I begin to function differently. Let me show you something kind of cool. A couple of weeks ago, a bunch of us, the staff, we were talking about Kohlberg's law, his moral development idea. How many of you have ever heard this? Kohlberg's moral development. Okay, a couple of us. He basically says this. There are six different ways that people function today. Different ways people develop. And so what I find really fascinating is that spiritually, religiously, I see religious folks in communities of faith falling into some of these. He says the lowest level, you guys ready for it? The lowest level of functioning, number one, is obedience and punishment. I do certain things because I'm scared. I do certain things because I'm afraid that I'm going to be punished. Think about how some people view God. I know tons of people in communities of faith. They are so scared of God. The only reason they come to church, the only reason they show up and do anything good in the world is because they are scared to death of God. They're terrified of him. And so they go because they want to not experience punishment. They want to avoid that punishment in the end. And so, because they think God's going to punish them severely and hurt them and all these things if they don't do what he wants. So they come to church. And what kind of people come to church that are living that way? They're angry. They're scared. They're nervous. You question anything and they lose it. 
Number two, which is not much better than number one, reward. If I get a reward, if I do, I'll do something good so that I can gain a reward. My dog functions that way. My dog. I'll tell my dog, roll over. She doesn't roll over because she's like, I want to make Tony so happy today. I want to give him the gift of seeing me smile. My dog is thinking of one thing, her Scooby snack. And some of us, we look at God that way. Our Scooby snack is some eternal life somewhere off in the distant future. And we're so focused on some reward, some way down, way, way down in the future, that we don't actually experience life now. We don't even experience the Scooby snack because we're too, too focused on the big one in the end. That we forget to experience life now and all we think about is a reward. That is a low level of functioning. One of the lowest. Number three says this, I do good things because I'm peer pressured. How many people do you know that go to church out of peer pressure? I've heard this before. They say, well, we got to show up for mom and dad because if we don't show up for mom and dad, they're going to be a little frustrated. We may not, and then they go back to reward. They may not give us a good birthday present next month. Is that how you view God? You do things in order to maybe get a reward or just do it because everyone else is doing it? So again, a low level of functioning. And number four, Law and order. I will be the first to admit when I'm driving and I see the sign that says 25 miles an hour and I have to begrudgingly hit the brake pedal. I'm not doing it because I am concerned with the children around me. I know I'm a terrible person. <laughs> I'm doing it because I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to have to deal with the issues that are going to come up when the police officer pulls me over, do you realize what you're doing? Yes, I realize what I was doing. Do you realize you? Yes, I do. I'm still going to fight this ticket, though. I'm still going to neg negotiate. Ridiculous. Some of us, we look at God that way as some angry police officer, right? It's a low level of functioning. So, these are what we call one through four pre-conventional, conventional concepts. And here's the sad thing. As I've been studying this concept, I looked at statistics. And again, take it as you will, 75 to 80 plus percent of people in the world are functioning on one through four. That many people in our world are functioning at that low level. And I would claim this, in Christianity, I would say easily 80%-ish are functioning that way. I've been to a lot of churches and so have you. And I see the majority of people in one through four. And I have to believe that breaks God's heart. It breaks his heart. Number five, it says this. Number five, I genuinely do things because I genuinely care about people's well-being. Think about that one. What if I could get to that place where I'm doing things because I genuinely care about people? I have an interest in people. That's called altruism. I genuinely want to help you. That's really nice. And think about that as far as understanding of a spiritual kind. I do things... I do things because I just naturally care about you. And I would say that desire to care for people comes from something much bigger than just an evolved person. I believe it comes from the understanding of God. And then number six, the ultimate way of functioning. It's this, love and respect for life and others. When I experience God... I understand I'm loved and I'm accepted, then I can begin to love and respect those around me. 
What did Jesus mean when he said the kingdom of God? You'd see it in your lifetime to his disciples. Think about what that early church looked like. They were functioning at a higher level. They had the agape feast. They were doing these beautiful things for one another. They were beginning to function with kingdom lives now. What will it take for our church to look like that? To begin to function at a level six rather than a level one. Out of fear or level two, reward. What will it take for you to begin functioning at a level six? If you're viewing God from a childlike Santa Claus perspective, you're in between two and three looking for a reward without actually understanding the giver. And if you're viewing yourselves as a Gentile did, undeserving of anything so broken down and beaten up, so unkind to yourself, how could you possibly love others? If you hate what you see in the mirror, if you think God is angry at you, all these things, how can you possibly be at a level six? How could you ever begin to function that way? If I look at the mirror and I hate what I am, I hate who I am, I can't love you. I don't even love myself. And that comes from a misunderstanding of God. And if you're seeing yourself through the eyes of the Jews, always trying to be better, look better, to gain acceptance and love, you will always see yourself as a, through a distorted picture of you and God. Galatians 2.18 says this, Rather, I am a sinner if I rebuild the old system of law that I already tore down. Some of us, we want to hold on to these old views of God. We want to function at a low level. And Paul says, no, it's been torn down. Look at 19. For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me, so I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. Living for God is functioning at level six. That's what it means to live for God. You begin to understand how to love and accept each other. And you bring kingdom life now. The doctrines, we keep all of it, come from an understanding of who God is. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there would be no need for Christ to die. Jesus would not have needed to come here. Praise God, Jesus showed us what the Father looks like. Praise God, he showed us what transformation looks like. When you understand God, look what happens. Jesus' life is one continual understanding of what it looks like when I live for Christ. So, here we go. If you think your good behavior saves you, there's no need for Jesus to come. How many of you have ever heard this? Be in the world, but not of it. When we hear this phrase, most of us go to, well, don't dress this way, don't do this, don't do that. Here's what I say. Here's what Paul would say. Be in the world, live in the world, but don't function like everybody else. Don't function at a level one, function at a level six. I lived like that for years, scared of God, doing what I thought was right because I wanted a reward, and it brought me nothing but pain slavery. I had so many battles that I lost. When I began to understand that I'm loved and accepted, I stopped in my spiritual journey crawling, and I began to dance. God is looking for dance partners, not people just simply crawling through life. I want to be a dance partner and a really good one. I'm tired of crawling through life. We're going to pray. I went over again. <laughs> We're going to pray, and uh, 
we're so thankful you're here today. Lord, we just thank you, we praise you, that you are a God that shows us how to function at a higher level. Because we're loved, we're accepted, Lord. We can begin to love, accept those around us. We can begin to bring kingdom now so that when we see you again, Lord, we are so excited to show you just what transformation has done for us and for our friends and our communities. And Lord, we can begin living kingdom with you soon. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for your acceptance. And God, again, we ask that you will help us dance through life rather than just stumble and crawl. Thank you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Offering will be taken up in the back. Again, we want to thank you guys for coming. Can't wait to see you next week. Pastor Dan will be speaking, and Nathan and I will be doing some praise together. It'll be really fun. All right. See y'all.